Well, good morning. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started. I think this mic is not on. Um, Thank you so much for coming out. You're at the first um, public learning session for the Melrose Public, uh, excuse me, Melrose Public Safety Buildings Advisory Committee, the work that we've been doing for the last year. So I really appreciate all of you taking your time out of your um, Saturday morning to join us and also for the folks who are on Zoom. I'm Eugenia Gibbons. I co-chair the committee along with my colleague Jeff McNaught, who's right over there. And I'm going to hand it over to Mayor Broder. Thank you very much, Eugenia. I want to um, echo our comments. I want to thank you all very much uh, for being here, for taking an interest in what is uh, the number one infrastructure challenge that our city is facing and, as most of you know, has been facing for quite some time. Um, we will go into some detail. Uh, about the need, but just to give you a sense, the last time we built a public safety building was, I want to say, 1964, um, and that is the new one. Um, and that, just bluntly, is unsustainable. The reason why we're sitting in a beautiful redone learning commons is because the community recognized the need to invest. Uh, the reason why we are attached to a middle school that's well, getting to be about 20 years old, but is new in school world for us, is because the community recognized the need to invest. Uh, in what we are talking about here today is a very important, a very expensive uh, investment in our future, but it is an important investment for every single man, woman, child in the community now and into the future. And importantly, it is also an important investment for the people who do the work, for the men and women of the Melrose Fire and Police Department that have been on the job um, you know, since the, since the foundation, founding of the city. Um, and interestingly, the, the headquarters, fire headquarters, is older than the city. Um, the city was um, formed as a city in 1900. Uh, so again, the um, the information uh, is somewhat complicated, but it is super important. And I also want to thank, I'd be remiss if I did not thank all the members of the Public Safety Building Committee. Uh, as you all know, they are all, uh, they are all volunteers, but they are all um, skilled professionals who have really put their heart and soul uh, into this work. And we are looking forward to presenting some information and hearing from the community about their impression of uh, potential plans going forward. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. So if we could um, go to the third slide. As uh, Mr. Mayor noted, as Mayor Broder noted, we have a very, um, very active and very committed committee that's been working for a little over a year to help to develop. Oh, next, next. Yeah. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Just trying to get so the Zoom is not. No worries. <laughs> No worries. Um, that has been working uh, pretty, pretty uh, diligently for the last year or so, a little over a year. And uh, to give you all some context, we have spent the better part of the last several months doing, um, engaging in learning and uh, pre-design work to really get a handle on not only what the needs are for um, for police and for fire, but also in trying to figure out what our, our, our ultimate goal is to help come up with a recommendation for how the city can proceed. Um, I think it's really important for everybody to understand that the challenges that Mayor Broder noted are not unique to Melrose. Many of our surrounding communities and many of the communities in the Commonwealth are facing similar um, challenges and questions when it comes to the need to invest in 21st century public safety facilities and facilities that are capable of allowing our police and fire to provide services that are essential to the community and that meet the needs of a growing community. So this is something that we have seen many neighboring communities grapple with. Um, investments that need to be made in, in buildings have, or communities that are making investments in similar buildings. And so Melrose is right where everybody else is. And that's important to know. Um, the other thing is we benefited immensely from the work that was done by a similar committee that um, concluded its efforts in about 2016-2017. 
and we were able to take uh, into consideration the work that they had done and the initial learning that they had done and we realized very quickly that we're sort of in a little different place in a little different position seven or eight years removed there are new economics that have to uh, be considered um, we at that time there was a little bit of um, there was there were different constraints that that organiz that committee faced our constraints today really revolve around a um, thinking about the needs and being really clear about what the needs of police and fire are and allowing that to drive our decision making and drive our um, considerations and our investments but then also we're in a post-covid era um, we are very close we have in proximity to Boston so there are costs uh, cost uh, increases that come with that and as I said, the, econo uh, the economics are just different today than they were eight years ago. So we have factored all of that into our consideration, and, and Emmanuel will speak to this later. We're thinking about that as well when we're um, considering sort of how we arrive at a recommendation. So with that, I'm going to actually turn the floor over to Emmanuel, Chief Kalina, and Chief Fowler. <laughs> um, <laughs> who will repronounce his name correctly for me, but um, they have been so instrumental in this early work, along with um, the rest of the committee back there. <laughs> I, see, I see Dale and I see Paul and a number of other folks who um, have done ye yeoman's work of um, digging into the details of all of the deficiencies of our current facilities and then trying to figure out you know, what needs should be met. Um, I will turn it to you, Emmanuel, to sort of steer us. I will let folks know that we're going to take about a half an hour or so to run through this presentation. If you have questions, I encourage you to make note of them. We're going to have a really robust conversation at the end of the presentation, and we want to hear from you all questions you have about the process that we've undertaken, questions that you might have as you run through Emmanuel's slides, and then we will wrap up with a preview of um, some additional upcoming sessions that we have planned for ongoing conversation and engagement. And again, our goal, our charter, our charge as a committee is to ultimately, ultimately package a report and a recommendation that we will deliver to the mayor and to city council by mid-June. So with that, I am going to hand it over to you all. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Andrade. I'm a Melrose resident. I live at, on Florence Street. Uh, and I'm here to, um, as the lead on the pre-design services, you know, the, uh, I'm an architect during the day. I help plan, design, and build uh, public buildings for the state government. So I'm very excited to share my expertise in, in municipal and local government. Uh, and I'm here with Chief Fowler, Chief Kalina, who have been instrumental in uh, preparing this effort and understanding the needs of both the police and fire. So to start, we're actually going to uh, visit our committee's website and see a virtual tour that both uh, the police department and the fire department put together for us. So with that, Elena, we're going to uh, go to the next slide and uh, showcase our first vir virtual tour, I believe, for the police station on the left. This is the Melrose Police Station. Built in 1900 as a telephone operations building, it was retrofitted to be a police station in the 1950s. The building has reached its lifespan in terms of effectiveness and storage. Most importantly, the building is no longer safe for the public and those who work inside. The current condition of the station is deplorable. Many ceiling tiles and floor tiles are broken and have been for years. In addition to cosmetic issues, the station does not have a ventilation system, is not handicap accessible, is deficient in many aspects of what a police station needs to run efficiently, and is unsafe for individuals who are placed in our custody. Those who are in custody are required to navigate a large staircase while in handcuffs, placing them and the officers in danger of falling. As policing, and what is asked of a modern day police department progresses, it is obvious that the city is underserved by the physical limitations of this building. For example, 
This station does not allow for privacy when speaking with the public in the main lobby or for custodial exchanges. The Melrose Police Department is excited to start new community policing programs, but there is no storage or space available to do so. We need your help in supporting our efforts to get a new station so that the Melrose Police Department can continue to provide exceptional service to our community and allow us to become a more integrated partner within the community by offering these new and exciting community policing programs. Thank you. This is the Melrose Fire Department headquarters. It was originally built and opened for operations in 1895, designed for horse-drawn carriages. The apparatus today barely fits into the station and sometimes going in and out, there are strikes to building, causing damage to the apparatus and or the building. The interior condition of the station has its challenges. First and foremost is the, the apparatus floor. The rear portion has been condemned we can't put live loads on it. And then the main apparatus floor is starting to show uh, signs of deterioration. Regarding the apparatus floor, the rear portion has been condemned, uh, but the main carrying beam that supports uh, both sections of floor is starting to decay. And uh, the fear is if that were to collapse, the floor and the apparatus would uh, fall into the basement. The second floor conditions, we have a uh, leaking roof it's the original roof from 1895, uh, so when it rains, it, it rains inside the fire station. Uh, potentially ca causing mold issues, uh, wiring, electrical wiring issues, and uh, decaying and rotting um, wooden structure. We have collapsed ceiling tiles, we have rodent issues, all, all in the same working areas as the firefighters work in. We look forward with the Public Safety Committee to move this project forward in renovating uh, fire headquarters. Thank you. This is the Tremont Street Fire Station. This fire station was built in the late 20s. Uh, it was built for motorized apparatus. Uh, however, the size of the door opening is challenging to modern day fire apparatus. The station's plumbing is outdated. Uh, we recently had uh, raw storage located into the basement. We do have a rodent problem down at Engine 2. Recently, we had a rat fall from a sailing in the kitchen area where the firefighters prep their food. Additionally, it sits on a, an area that frequently floods. So we get heavy rains and the water starts backing up on the Melrose Street underneath the train tracks because the water level has got as high as six feet into the basement of Engine 2. A new station on the same location uh, with the elimination of the basement would resolve that issue. Welcome to the East Foster Street Fire Station. This station was built in 1964. This station has its challenges as well. The floor is cracked um, and water does leach down into the basement area. The living quarters is right off the apparatus floor and the living quarters is where they prepare their food. It's not recommended that you have your know, living quarters right off the main uh, fire apparatus floor due to the carcinogens. There are two known roof leaks in both sides of the building causing severe uh, slip and fall hazards inside the building. It is the committee's hope that this building would be raised as well and a new building put in its place with a second uh, floor addition. Thank you. So both the police and the fire department did a great job uh, preparing these videos, and they're available on... This is the Melrose Fire Department. And this is the Melrose Police Station. Built it. They're available on our committee's website for, for anyone who wants to uh, play them again. Uh, but they paint uh, a good picture of the deplorable conditions uh, of those buildings. And uh, to start, we're actually going to show you the history of those stations, because it is important for us to understand the context of why we're here today. So starting with the next slide, uh, Elena, um, and it's an animation, so you have to click for me. Starting with the, in 1884, uh, the police station was actually stationed on the first floor of town, town Hall, right, 1884. Uh, I believe there was a firing range on the, in the basement, and we're, all fi we're finding this information through uh, newspaper articles that are over 100 years old. Uh, this station was, became, it was a small station, uh, there were four uh, uh, police officers, um, and 
within 10 years, it became too small. It was actually called, uh, according to uh, newspaper articles, the police cheese box. It was, was labeled the smallest police, head, police headquarters in any city of the size of Melrose in the United States by 1916. Uh, moving forward, by 1895, our central fire uh, was built to replace a, an older and smaller fire station across the street where, uh, between the Baptist Church and the old bar, uh, cemetery where the, where the um, old high school was. Uh, as Chief Colina mentioned, it was uh, the original equipment was horse-drawn and it became uh, mechanized uh, in, by 1919. And if you look at this image, the only thing that changed, it's original, uh, to the, uh, the region, it's, it's, it hasn't changed in the last 100 years uh, when the cupola on the fire hose tower was removed 100 years ago. So for the last 100 years, the building hasn't changed on exterior. Now we're going to 1929 when Engine 2 was uh, built. It was built to replace a smaller, older fire station right next to where La Cuchara is today. It's uh, basically an empty lot. It's an entrance to the parking lot. There used to be a fire station there, and that's what this fire station replaced. Um, 1950, right, the police station moved from City Hall to this new, uh, or this uh, brand new building. It was built in 1907, and it used to be the uh, telephone exchange uh, building. Uh, in 1949, the Board of Aldermen visited the building, inspected, and said it was assessed at $50,000, and they said back then, in 1949, ideal for the conversion of, to police purposes. Maybe for policing in the 1940s, not policing in 2023. Finally, 1964, Engine 3 uh, replaced an older and smaller fire station on the same site, and we have maps from 1903 that show that older fire station for the first time. So next uh, click. You know, the lesson here is that between 1895, when the first fire station, the, the, the you know, central fire was built, in 1964, when the last fire station was built, for a period of 70 years, Melrose has tackled one public building at a time. And what we're doing here today is exactly what happened before for 70 years you're replacing older buildings that are too small for the, for the operation of the day. And perhaps what we're trying to do here is very uh, aggressive. You know, they had 70 years to replace four stations one at a time. We're perhaps presenting a, a proposal to replace all four stations in seven years in one pass. So that's, that is really the lesson learned here from this uh, timeline. So next, uh, we're going to present uh, the beginning of our pre-design uh, service. And I keep referring to pre-design because we're not doing design at this point. We're doing pre-design. Um, to start, we had a survey that was prepared by our architect, Doran Whittier. Uh, and that survey was released to both uh, the police and fire department. So the, the, the chiefs will uh, give you a highlight of what we learned when we asked questions to uh, their personnel. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, again, I, my name is uh, Chief Kevin Fallier, and I'm um, excited to be part of this process uh, moving forward. But this slide in particular here, as Emmanuel had mentioned, uh, surveys went out to our personnel as well as the fire personnel. And, you know, the obvious reason of a survey is to try to get um, the temperature of the men and women that work in the buildings. You know, what, what, what do we need? What's lacking? Uh, and what can we get moving forward? So this slide here is basically some of the quotes from the survey. And I will say I was very proud of uh, the people that work uh, with me. You know, we had, I think it was 75%-ish response rate, which is outstanding. And it goes to their character that they really care about the station. They care about the community moving forward. So some of the quotes we have here, um, our building is in every way not fit for a 21st century law enforcement agency. This is impairing our ability to serve the public in a professional manner while also reducing morale, quality of life within the workspace. Second, the existing building's far too small. We lack the space and amenities expected of a workplace. We have no ADA access. Um, 
most of you may know that, we're not even handicap accessible. We have no classroom, which is very important for training and education, you know, which is one of the six pillars of 21st century policing um, training, moving forward, educating our police officers, having a community room uh, where the community come in, uh, can come in and have events. So we don't have that. Uh, we have multi multiple senior administrative personnel sharing offices. I don't think we have one office, maybe other than my, myself, that is for one person. We're, we're double, tripled up for command staff and, and patrol offices. Um, almost every room in our building serves a multi-purpose room. We, we have a room that we interview suspects. We have a room, uh, that same room that we have lunch in. It's the same room we interview domestic violence victims or sexual assault victims. It, and it, it's just not best practices for a police department. You, you have to have those rooms separated and provide the, you know, the best quality service. Um, and then lastly, one of the quotes is the Merrill's Police Department, building as it exists now is undersized in all facets. And before I turn it over to Chief Kalina, um, you know, most of you know me now after five months on, um, and I just want to quickly reference coming from Medford Police, I had the opportunity to uh, be in a brand new police station from 2019 until um, December of this year, uh, 2022. So I worked in a brand new police station that had everything and then some. What we could have asked for, we received in the city. And it did absolutely wonders for morale, officer safety and wellness, which is another 21st century pillar. Um, it, it just, it, it, I don't even know how to quantify it, but not only the, the, the men and women that worked in there, it made them feel more proud, it made them feel better about themselves, it increased relationships, I think, within the department, but, but more importantly, the community was proud of it. We, in Medford, hosted open houses. We had so many community meetings in this giant community room that seated, I think, 60 to 70 people. We used it as a vaccination center during the pandemic. So it's not our building, the police's building, it's our building, the city's building, and we need it, uh, we want it, and uh, I think with you know the cooperation and the, the great work that I walked into after this committee's been together for over a year shows that we're moving in the right direction. Good morning. Name's Ed Kalina, Fire Chief. Um, I too have been working uh, hard with the committee to try to identify our shortfalls uh, in the fire stations. And um, as you can see from the, the slide up here, um, the rank and file members of the fire department, they were concerned with plumbing issues throughout uh, all three stations. We uh, have mold uh, that we can see and uh, we don't know what we can't see. Um, we, they identified the air conditioning and heating as an issue in the buildings that, um, you know, last year or two, I think it was two years ago, it was 86 degrees um, inside the building and uh, I think it was in the 90s outside, but there was no relief and these uh, members were expected to stay on duty. Um, th that situation has been fixed. Uh, the roof le that leaks it says here the ceilings leak, but that's due, due to the roof leaking. Um, there is no con um, training facility within the fire station. Um, we sometimes have to train right where we eat and prep our food. Um, that was a concern of the members who uh, participated in the survey. Um, the dormitories where the uh, men and women uh, they're sharing the same space. It's, it's not best practice to do that. Um, but the, the space is, uh, it's confining it at fire headquarters. Um, we do not have any accessibility, handicapped ac accessibility um, into the building. Anybody coming to fire prevention has to climb almost uh, a flight and a half of stairs. Um, so it's, it's the wish of the members that participated in the survey that uh, we have new new facilities um, to work in, to take pride and ownership in. And um, I want to thank each and every one of them for the, the hard work that they do on a daily basis uh, under 
less than desirable working conditions at the fire stations. Thank you. So by now the conditions of these stations are um, very well documented. Um, and we're going to paint a picture of what we've done in the last uh, 18 months and starting with even before we, we were able to hire an architectural firm to assist us with our effort, we as a group uh, created some principles to guide the architects in the development of options. And those, those principles are, came before the pre-design and they are location agnostic, meaning, you know, let's talk about the potentials before we start designing or pre-designing. Uh, pre the first one that became very clear, and as Eugenia mentioned, we had the benefit of having a, a study, a feasibility do study done five years prior. So we analyzed that study and came to the conclusion that the police station cannot remain where it is. The police department needs a brand new building. That new building cannot happen in that, on that site. The site is too small, the building is too small, uh, the building cannot be renovated uh, for a new police station. So the goal, we knew right off the bat that we need a new police station at a new location. The issue is, where is this new location? And we're going to present to you later where the location, where our preferred location is but it's a location that you know, had to be selected by the city. The committee has no power to selecting uh, a site. Next one, um, also based on the previous study, no, the committee is recommending no reduction to the number of fire stations. So uh, we, we have maps from 1874, 75, 87, 92, and we can, we can see using those maps that Melrose has had three fire stations for at least 120 years. We're, this committee is not recommending the change to that because the previous effort recommended the reduction of fire stations. And that has a tremendous impact on, resource, uh, on response times. Uh, third principle, no combined public safety uh, building. This is something that is done in neighboring uh, cities, some very close to us, but the reality is that in our little city, we don't have a city, uh, a site, we don't have a parcel big enough to contain a big building that houses two departments under one roof. Number four, it is important that the fire department uh, in control of three fire stations that when we are renovating stations or upgrading or replacing stations, whatever it is, that the services provided by the fire department cannot be impacted by construction. We need to uh, figure out a way to, to maintain the, the, uh, some fire stations in operation. And then the final one, which is the most important, we need to design for the next 50 years. We want to avoid and we have to invest correctly and so that we avoid having to redo work in the next decade or in the next two decades. And if you uh, without naming names, if you look north of Melrose, that's the situation that some communities are. They didn't invest properly 20 years ago and they have to redo uh, that investment so, uh, you know, soon after. So with the next slide, uh, I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about the, the, the pre-design process and schedule with our architects, Doreen Whittier, um, who are experts, they're, they're architects, they're experts on public safety buildings like police stations and, and fire stations. Uh, so our committee was working since uh, December of 2021. Uh, by October, we were ready to bring an architect on board. Our committee has done all we could until that point. We needed support of a professional architectural firm to help us go to the finish line. And we're so close to the finish line uh, now at the end of April. Uh, so we, uh, the Appropriations Committee believed our request and, you know, granted us uh, funds to hire this architect. So by December 1st, actually it was uh, Chief Follier's first day on the job, uh, we started the, 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 the pre-design process where we met with the chiefs and we, we had conversations and, you know, we, they created questionnaires and those, the results of those questionnaires is what you saw in the previous slides. Um, and they, they started tackling the space needs analysis. Let's take a look what the 2017 feasibility study said of what a police and fire station should be. 
And let's ask those questions again in 2023 and find answers. Um, we're working on conceptual diagrams, right? Not, we're not doing design, so we don't have floor plans, but we have our conceptual diagrams. But we have uh, a schedule and we have cost estimates. So, uh, and soon enough, uh, in about two weeks, we're going to be reviewing the final, final deliverables. And what we're learning here today will be incorporated in those final deliverables in two weeks. So that next time we come back at the end of May, I believe, we're ready to uh, show some uh, final deliverables. So in the next slide, I want to present something that is called the space needs analysis. This is a spreadsheet with um, an analysis of the current spaces in those four public buildings. And in the future, what, those, what an ideal public building would be. So I recommend folks, these, are, these documents are available on our website. You, for folks who are really interested in what happens in a new police station and a new fire station, please go take a look at those drawings and dissect. Uh, I had a member of the committee ask me, so Emmanuel, in, th in 30 seconds, tell me what is being improved in these uh, police and fire stations. And my answer is everything. As Chief Fowler said, they're using rooms. Uh, each room has three functions, right? Everything in a public, new public safety building is being renovated. From the public areas, you know, in, uh, providing vestibules and lobbies to these buildings that do not have today. Uh, buildings that, you know, in the 1940s, 50s, did not require accessibility compliance. Uh, we're expanding administration and operation spaces, adding training spaces, offices, for the police station detention spaces, that they don't have uh, uh, optimal detention spaces right now. For the fire department, modern apparatus, uh, rooms um, and I'm going to show you if you have an if you want an idea of how small a fire station is today for a new equip for new equipment for a new ladder truck drive by engine two and see the addition that they had to provide to extend that fire station about 20 30 feet to, so they can fit a new ladder truck and finally this these stations are so old that we need to uh, modernize the infrastructure new uh, uh, accessible stairs and elevators, uh, better egress stairs, uh, utility rooms. If you can imagine, a, a, a brand new building cannot operate, needs a lot more space than a, a 1960s uh, fire station. So in the next slide, we're going to present our preliminary construction schedule. Uh, we know that we cannot fix all four buildings at once. We need to... Uh, basically play this game of uh, almost Chinese puzzle and figure out what can be done first so that the next phase can, can, can uh, happen. Right now we're proposing a three-phase approach. In phase one, um, which would take about 26 months of construction, this is just construction, there is a period of design that has to happen before construction starts, but just construction, 26 months, uh, where the police department will remain in the current police station for that period, um, while a new police station is built at a new site, which I'll, I'll, I'll review in a second. Um, personnel from Engine 2, which is also uh, being uh, upgraded during that Phase 1, would have to relocate to the other two fire stations. Unfortunately, those two fire stations are too small to handle all the personnel for the three stations, so we need some temporary quarters that we have to figure out uh, uh, during that construction uh, period. Um, when the pol new police station is built and it's uh, ready to be occupied, the old, let's call the old police station can be uh, vacated and uh, personnel can from fire personnel can occupy the brand new engine two. Next slide, please. And one more, one more click to phase two. So phase two we, would be the gut renovation of central fire. Um, so move the, the personnel from central fire to the brand new engine two uh, and basically gut renovate that building. One thing that we learned from the architects is that renovation alone 
is not possible. Uh, is not what we need. We need a, a, about a four or five thousand square foot addition behind the building uh, to allow a new elevator, new egress stairs, and new space. Uh, and finally, in phase three, engine three would be uh, uh, a, a, the, that build, the existing building would be torn down and a brand new station would be built on that location, a much bigger building. Uh, when that is accomplished, we'll have a brand new police station, we'll have two brand new fire stations, and central fire will be fully renovated in an addition in the back of the building. And at that point, which could take right now between six, seven, eight years, we're still refining those, that, that time frame. That's what it would take to uh, upgrade all four public buildings in Melrose without affecting the services by the fire station, by the fire department. In the next slide, we can see our preliminary score footage. And I, wanna, I want to share uh, what we have today, what uh, the effort in 2017 told us about investment and what our committee is proposing in 2023. So right now, you can see the total square footage existing today uh, of four buildings is about 36,000 square feet. That's what we have today. In 2017, uh, the proposed total gross square footage was about, let's call it 55,000 square feet. Um, and what we're proposing today is a lot more. It's 96,000 gross square feet. And the difference between 2017 and today is that when we talk about the police station, in five years ago or six years ago, they thought a police station would be about 24,000 square feet. Well, we think, that's so, uh, we think that as well, uh, but our new police station is a little bigger. It has a firing range, so uh, it's about 30,000 square feet. The 2017 effort actually reduced the number of fire stations and combined central fire and engine two at the, the engine two location. So I just want to compare right now central fire and engine two uh, add up to, let's say, 21,000 square feet. And six years ago, the proposal was to, on to add only 2,000 square feet uh, to, the, to the fire department. So as an architect, my analogy here is that the police station got, was, in, uh, was invested at a brand new house while the fire department only got a one car garage because 2,000 square feet is basically the space of one apparatus bay. That's what the fire department uh, uh, got in, in 2017 as a proposal. And Engine 3, there was no increasing that very little fire station. It's just you know, a little bit of uh, uh, code, building code improvements, but we're, they were not expanding that fire station. So uh, what we believe is needed today in Melrose to fix all four public safety buildings is 96,000 square feet. In the next slide, we're going to review the preliminary cost estimate, which would be over $120 million. Um, I am going to share the major factors of that cost. Uh, while other cities and towns around Melrose are dealing with one building at a time, Woburn built one new fire station. Um, Wakefield is working on an, renovating their public uh, safety building. Uh, Medford has a new police station. They're dealing with one building at a time. Melrose has to build, deal with four buildings at a time. So that is the major impact of the budget you see on the screen. Another uh, major factor, these are total project costs. There are construction costs and there are total project costs which uh, increase the, the cost. These are the costs to pay for soft fees like hiring the architect to design, uh, hiring the construction manager to build and help with the design. Uh, pay for furniture, all those things uh, add up to the project. So these are total project costs. And there are escalations and contingencies, right? These are not, co th this cost estimate already uh, takes into consideration the escalation to start construction for Engine 3 starting in 2026. So these are not 23 numbers, 
2023 numbers. This includes 2026 numbers. So uh, that impacts the, the cost. Next one, uh, this cost estimate is based on 96,000 gross square feet. Um, this is based on the police and fire department's uh, needs today, and it's their needs today, but also their needs in the near future. So the design has a little bit of wiggle room as their personnel increases, as they purchase a new letter truck or new equipment, that those stations, those buildings will be designed for the new future, the near future. Um, and you can see here in the bullet number three that we're saying they're based on the optimal space needs. We didn't say ideal space needs because if we, if we classify this as ideal, these stations would be 10% bigger than they are what we're presenting. We already went through a value management process where we uh, shaved off some square footage and, and made some cuts. And what we're presenting here today is 96,000 square feet. They're smaller than the ideal but they're optimal. Any reduction in square footage during the design phase, which could start next year, would result in a less than optimal space for the police and fire departments. Um, next one, we pay a premium in construction costs in living six miles north of Boston. There is a premium that we pay as a community by being within the 95 belt. And so when comparing to other other communities outside of the 195, just be careful that we pay a premium. If you know the, the, the cost of your house, you, you know the premium that we, we, we pay for living so close to the city. And last one is the pandemic area, era construction costs, right? We, we can't really compare what we're doing today with even with the Medford police in 2019, pre-pandemic costs. This is a different ball game right now in 2023. So, that has an impact on our effort. And last but not least, our, our next slide where we're sharing with the public for the first time where uh, the new police station would be. So Elena, if you don't mind sharing the next slide. Uh, after a, a thorough analysis by the city where there were some potential sites, uh, the city has uh, designated uh, the old Ripley School location at 94 Lebanon. If you click one more time, Elena, I think the, the address, yeah, there you go. The Ripley School at 94 Lebanon Street as perhaps the, the best site available that is city owned, so we don't have to worry a, a, about costs about, of acquiring new land, private land. So uh, uh, a lot there already exists. Uh, the building would have to be torn down, of course, because it's not viable for uh, a police station. But it's at over two acres, it's big enough to accommodate uh, a new police station and the ancillary structures that need to happen behind the building, enough parking for the police department, all of that. Uh, it's a corner lot, which is great for, uh, you know, accessing uh, from, you know, both sides of the building. And right now is the best option we have today. So with that, that's the end of the, the pre-design uh, slides. So thank you. So we have two more slides with some helpful information for future meetings, and then we'll open it up to questions. I'm, I'm hopeful that there are questions. <laughs> or maybe the fair net. Um, next slide, please, Elena. There should be, well, uh, let, me, let me try something. That's all right. There was one more slide. We'll just circulate all the information we posted to our website. We do have two upcoming additional learning sessions. There is a police and fire open house. So you can tour firsthand um, what we saw in the videos and what you heard about today. Those will be held on May 16th. And then we have um, another learning session back here in the Learning Commons um, where we'll be able to present more refined detail. Emmanuel alluded to the fact that we're still kind of finishing up some of these early pre-design um, analysis work. And so on May 30th, we'll reconvene um, to present uh, that information. 
Our website is posted, so if folks want to take a chance when they have an opportunity to take the chance to view the website, a lot of this information is all there. And if you have questions that don't get answered today, feel free to reach out to the committee at the email address that's on the website as well. We are always available to um, field questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. I don't know if we have any questions in the Zoom chat or if there are any in the room. We have a mic that we can um, walk around uh, to folks if you have questions. You've heard a lot today, but I think the main takeaways I hope that you leave with are that you know, Melrose is not in a unique position. It's not finding itself in a unique position where it needs to make a substantial investment in key facilities that will um, house essential services in our community. Um, it is a significant investment, but it is one that, um, you know, waiting is not an option. Waiting does not make it less significant. <laughs> it only makes it more significant. Um, what was presented was a proposal for work completed over a fair amount of time. So we're talking about you know six to seven years of, com of construction um, for all four buildings to be completed. But we're trying to also think about a phased approach that allows the least disruption to services possible over that period of time and allows our police and fire to continue doing the, good, the great work that they're doing in the community without disruption while we update and upgrade their facilities. Um, We've, as Emmanuel noted, we presented an optimal solution. Um, we have projected costs. You know, some of these things will be further refined as we have even more precise information made available. But um, the one thing that doesn't change is that time is of the essence, and this is really um, this is really something that's essential for the community to have to, to take on. So it won't be um, it won't be easy, but it'll be worthwhile. Before we have questions, do you have anything you want to add, Mr. Mayor? Um, so there, uh, I will say that there, there, uh, the committee has fielded a lot of questions, and there's some Q&A uh, up on the website. One thing that has come up a lot that um, bears repeating is a lot of folks ask, well, where is the state or federal program that we're going to tap in order to defray some of the costs? Because that's what we do with schools. That's what we did with the library. We leveraged significant dollars from outside the community. Regrettably, just to be clear, that does not exist. When you see um, any kind of support for public safety infrastructure coming from the state or federal government, it tends to be very small and very pre-programmed. There are 911 grants, not you know, very helpful. There are some equipment grants. Uh, very helpful, but nothing that goes to uh, basic infrastructure. And while there is a push on Beacon Hill to create something akin to uh, the school building authority, I don't think that is going to happen in the uh, in the near future, or maybe not even in the mid mid pack future. I think that's that's, that's a long a long way to go. Um, we have non fire and these questions. Yes. Let's go. Do you need my name? Yes. That's okay. okay. With Joanne O'Kennedy. I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Melrose. Uh, I've noticed that at the two crosswalks, one, one where the Met, uh, Mexico Lindo is and one where CVS is. I believe there's supposed to be 20 feet between a parked car and the crosswalk. The first one I measured outside the Mexico Lindo was like eight feet on both sides. And then the other one I didn't bother to measure because I think it was even less. So. Um, I'm also curious as to why all these wonderful signal signs that light up weren't, uh, wasn't thought, thought to do that in those two intersections. Because they're really busy. Parked cars everywhere. 
So, um, my last question is about resource offices. I believe there's one in the high school and one in the middle school. Correct. But none in grades below the middle school. Correct. And that's, in this day and age, pretty absurd, in my opinion, not to have a police officer in every room. In every room? No, every school. <laughs> Well, every room, too, would be good. <laughs> no, every school. I'll try to give a brief answer. Respectfully, that's not really germane to what, what, what we're here for today, but they are, uh, they are important questions. The Traffic Commission has done some um, regulation to increase lines of sight to make, to make crossing opportunities uh, safer. Um, as for the way those signs are, installed, they get rolled out over time. Uh, we fund them every year and essentially um, we had a lot of requests and we talked to our friends at the police department about how to prioritize over time uh, where those go because they're, they're very popular and they could go a lot of places. We tend to focus a bit around the schools to be sure, uh, but those are areas um, that will continue to continue to try to attack over time. With regard to your question about uh, resource officers in the schools, I don't want to get out over my skis, so I'll look to Chief Fallier and the others um, from the police department. But uh, staffing and personnel are very directly tied to our existing facility constraints. So that's an excellent example of a service that's essential to the community that police provides but is somewhat constrained in terms of um, you know, how it can be expanded. There are a number of things that contribute to that, but I know if you were to speak to any of the officers, they could probably talk to you about several different services that police provides in the community that they would love to be able to expand upon, but are just, at this moment, not able to do so, in part because of their facility limitations. So I just want to connect that back to your questions and acknowledge that there is a direct connection to this conversation, at least with regard to that point. Um, there was another question right there. Uh, so Maureen Busby, long time, uh, Melrose, oops. Just one second, microphone. Kind of microphone. Thank you so much. Maureen Busby, long time Melrose resident. Um, any questions that I have, and I have several, I'll only ask one at a time but they're not a criticism of what I heard today or, or what the plans are, just, just a question to get more information. I fully support the, um, the renovation of any of our public safety buildings um, as I support the uh, renovation of Mel City Hall where I work. And I, we have some similar issues, not as serious as those at the fire stations and, and the police stations, so I appreciate that those should go first. Um, and so anyway, uh, my first question, and as, as I said, I'll do just one at a time. It looked like from one of the slides that we, for Station 2, or Engine 2, you call it, we went from 7,400 square feet to 27,000 square feet. Is that, was that correct on the slide? And I'm just curious, um, that's a station closest to where I live, and not, again, not a criticism, but is, is there space and why was that station um, intended to be so large? So Engine 2 was built in 1929. It's almost 100 years old. It only has two bays, apparatus bays. They're too narrow. Uh, the doors are too narrow. The, state, the room itself to uh, park a, a letter truck is too short. As you can see in addition that they did last fall. Uh, what they need is four bays. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's they, expansion to four bays. It's that. It's a lot more space that didn't was wasn't required a hundred years ago that is required today. It's handicap accessibility. It will be a multi-story building. It needs elevators. It needs more egress stairwells. Uh, everything in that station needs to be. So that was not a mistake. The what they have today basically is a third of what they need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I can follow that, you, you tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, first, it's, it's not an important point, but it's one word that bears mentioning is Emmanuel keeps referring to the, um, the elevators. There are no elevators to see how in any of the buildings um, as we sit here today. So uh, an, obvious, an obvious accessibility problem. Um, 
Part of the reason, and again, I want, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, for a dramatic expansion, really, at Engine 2 is um, fire headquarters literally can't grow. It, the, there's a limited ability to make it grow in the back, um, neither side. You certainly couldn't add uh, another bay there. So we are, we are limited in what we can do at headquarters. Thank you. Um, Monica Madero Solano, a Melrose resident. Uh, I am, I just want to first thank you all for your hard work on this. Uh, it's, it's nice to see this moving ahead. Um, I just wanted to get a better idea of how we expect that this will affect uh, residents, in, not necessarily from the service side, but in terms of the, the cost side. Uh, my understanding is this is expected to be a debt exclusion um, is this for the November ballot? Um, how long of a term does this go out for? And do we have an idea of what the expected average cost would be for each resident? Sure, did everyone hear the question? It's a, essentially, how is how's the funding mechanism going to work? Um, it is absolutely going to be a debt exclusion. It you know, probably goes without saying that's something that's going to cost at least $120 million. It's not something that we can fit under uh, Prop 2.5, even if we you know, maxing out our, our traditional borrowing. And it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be a hit. I don't have precise numbers for you yet. Um, that is coming. Gene, you want to follow? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. It is a, one that we are also very curious to have a more precise answer about. So I would encourage folks to, to attend the third learning session on May 30th. We are hopeful that at that point we'll be able to have even more information about um, the mechanism, the debt exclusion, to be able to pay for this and uh, some estimation of what that might look like, what the tax impacts might be. But at this time, we don't have that information. It'd be purely speculation because we're still working with very preliminary pre-design information. Um, but we are thinking about it, so. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Eric Wildman. Um, I also want to thank everybody for their efforts on this um, work. As someone that served on a committee um, that did a lot of planning and a lot of, um, you know, whether it's you know, I was on the school committee closing schools and redistricting the city, I know there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. When it gets dropped from the public, all you're going to hear is questions and critiques. I have a handful of questions and critiques. Um, I have a bunch of the police in the fire, so I'll do the police first and then. I'll come back at this time for questions. So on the police station, I get, I'm be honest, I'm very disappointed in the Ripley School location. I think anybody north of the Fellsway for response times um, is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, if you, I'm, I guarantee you if you drive right down, right now, this car is parked on both sides, Lebanon Street, at a softball game. Um, my car's not there, it's here. Um, and especially the Chief Fowler reference, you know, it's great in the community making that a community center, which our police station really should be. I, I, I'm fine with the square footage. I think of all that, that square footage is fine. I, I had a family member working that building for two decades. It was bad then, I'm sure it hasn't gotten any better. Um, has there been any discussion relative to I mean, a $120 million project? I know, you know, what's another million? But looking at the two buildings, the 70 and 80 West Foster Street, and approaching or eminent domain those two buildings, because that, Plots in L. If you fill in that L, that's corner lot, um, still downtown, accessible to the community. Um, people, you know, community police are walking out the front door into the, into the heart of downtown. I just, I think Ripley School is, a, is, a, is, a, is, in my humble opinion, uh, is, a, is, a, is a pretty unfortunate location. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for your question. I'll, I'll address the, um, I guess I'll address the second one uh, about the eminent domain. That's a little bit out of my pay grade. So I'm not going to answer that one. But as far as the location of the Ripley School, um, not a question that I wasn't expecting uh, due to the location of it, right? It's on the, the far end, uh, which would be the west side, I believe, to, the mall end. Uh, my simple answer to that, sir, is, is police officers are mobile. They, they, we don't respond from the station. 
in an ideal world, right? So they are assigned sectors one, two, and three. And this, it's, well, that's where we differ from the fire. So they respond from the station, and that's why it's, it's very important to have at least the three fire stations set in different parts of the city. Um, what we were faced with as far as looking and recommending for us, um, locations, there really wasn't another one more century located that would fit our needs space-wise and otherwise. Um, so being at the Ripley School should not affect response time or the delivery of services, in my opinion. Because like I said, we, we hit roll call, the only time would be uh, change of shift, usually when the, you know, the cruisers are swapping up. And once, they, once we do roll call, they're out, and they, you know, they should be way all around the, the city. And from an architecture standpoint, I can tell you that we looked uh, what it would mean to use, increase the size of the, the current site for the police station using those two buildings. The total is half acre. It's not big enough for a new police station. Uh, the current uh, Ripley School site is 2.09 acres. That is what they need. First of all, thank you for holding this, this meeting. This is very informative, very educational. Uh, my name is Tony Mendonca. I live at 102 Richardson Road. I'm a newbie. I've only been here 23 years. Um, <laughs> Still unpacking. <impacted. laughs> my question is, uh, from date of uh, demolition to construction, what's the time frame between the start of the project to when the police department will move, move into the Ridley School? This is a question relative just for the police station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, assuming that we're doing pre-design, we still need to do almost one year of design, right? So, assuming that maybe after the November election there is a decision of the funding for this project and then we're ready to hire an architecture firm to do one year of design. So, it's safe to say that 2024 will be all design phase. The earliest that is realistically possible to have uh, construction to start would be spring of 2025. So spring of 2025 is when construction would start. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that it would be uh, 20, 26 months of construction. So we're talking about uh, summer of 2027 is when the chief Fowler would be able to uh, move furniture and staff, in addition to the new furniture, they'll be already waiting for them in a new building, uh, to the brand new police station. So summer of 2027. Again, these are very preliminary numbers. We're refining. We still have two or three weeks to refinement, but this paints a good picture for you of when that building will be ready. Uh, of course, that we can push that much earlier if we decide that we, can, we should start design tomorrow. Right? Maybe we can get that building done by 2026. But because we're waiting until elections to make a decision on the future of this effort, this is really what it delays the start of the project. We had a question via the chat uh, over Zoom that you've already answered, so you don't have to answer it again, but the participant did want it read into the record as a, uh, recorded as a question. The Ripley location seems very far away from the center of the city and I'd be concerned about the increase in response times. Um, and that they be realistically considered, uh, they re sorry. I'll be looking forward to seeing studies about response times and that they be realistic considering the likely traffic impediments. Is that a question related to the police station or no, Just the Ripley School at the police station. And he said he doesn't need it answered again. He just wanted it conveyed that there okay. was another question. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. You were me, Eric. I don't care. 
So you spoke to the need to make sure that we're doing a design that lasts for 50 years. Um, and I was just curious, and this is really just a curiosity question, um, how much has the group looked into, you know, this, the futuristic stuff like drones and robots and things like, we may not be using the same kinds, of, I can imagine we'll always have police cars, fire trucks or whatever, but what else is coming that um, should be possibly looked into as you, as you refine the design? So the construction costs include um, a line item called FFNE, Furniture, Furnishings and Equipment, uh, but it's only equipment that is related to the building itself. So it's the mechanic, it's the boilers, the furnace, and you know, the, maybe the photovoltaic panels on the roof. Uh, your question is really related to something that can be, that sh it's not a construction cost, it's funded by the department's operational budget, so I don't, uh, it, it, that is separate from this effort. Um, we are, in terms of funding, but we are looking for uh, creating a building that has enough storage for that equipment that you're just referring to. We are providing uh, a sally port, you know, right now the, the, the sally port is used, there has three, three different functions for the sally port today on East Foster Street. Uh, the future building will have spaces that are designed for that function, so uh, plenty of storage, plenty of infrastructure spaces, and as, it's, as I said, the building is designed for the near future, so there is space as, you know, spaces need to be converted for a different function. There is space and potential for that. Thank you. I just want to add real quickly to that. Uh, with my past experience coming from Method and, and being on a similar committee, myself and the chief at the time literally had the shovels and hard hats, putting shovels on the ground and then to the very end picking out paint and furniture for every single room in the building. But rewind a little bit, before we did that, we toured upwards of 10 uh, communities that had new stations, say within five to 10 years, as part of the group, and interviewed and listened to and had tours, talked to the command staff and also talked to the patrol officers that are actually doing the work to see what worked and what didn't work in brand new buildings. And you'd be surprised, some of the brand new stations, they, once they moved in, they were out of space within six months. Um, so when we designed the building in 2019, or moved in in 2019, we had future planning, future growth, future everything. And even when I left, I was looking around, I'm like, wow, that, we didn't think we'd use that room. And there's somebody in there now. So, you know, you look at the square footage from the, from the slide earlier, and there may be a little bit of, I don't want to call it sticker shock, but 7,000 square feet that we're in now is, is absurd, uh, to be honest with you. And, um, so going up to 30,000, 31,000, which we sat and did the pre-design with, that's what we think is the optimal space needs. And, you know, drones and robots and stuff, you know, awesome. I, I, <laughs> I look forward to all that stuff, but as far as designing and building, if people are looking at the square footage, um, I do have a little bit, and the committee has a little bit of experience, at least for us here looking. And that's what I think the open house will be huge for members of the community come, to come into our, our places and see not only the size, but just the conditions that we're working in. And I, I threw this out there on an interview I did last week. Uh, the Medford chief is very welcome and opening if anybody wants to come to Medford and see sort of what the ideal new, green, friendly, open police station can be. Thank you. So, you know, I'm following up, Chief, you know, my thunder a little bit on the, on the fire side. Um, we mentioned it, uh, but it, but it bears repeating. Uh, it's not a terrific idea, as I understand it, to have basements in fire stations because they flood and because you need to support the apparatus. And the chief can tell you better than I can, the changing nature of apparatus, the apparatus tends to be larger, uh, it tends to be heavier, particularly if it's carrying more water than in the past. And Honestly, if you want to talk about, you know, a little bit far out into the future, to the extent we would be moving towards electric as opposed to diesel vehicles, those vehicles are far, far, far heavier than anything that's, that's in the fleet. And I know I'm not sitting here making a commitment to an all-electric fleet. I want, that, I want that pretty clear. 
but that does seem to be the wave of the future. If there are going to be um, federal incentives around uh, police and fire, I suspect it's going to be more on the equipment side and potentially more uh, on the green side. So we need to be thinking about that as well in a lot of the design aspects. Uh, yeah, I have one quick question, actually, and I'll email the rest of them. Um, I guess two things. One, what, what's changed since the Carlson Group report about going from three to two stations and the analysis they did in response times that we just abandoned that as a, as a concept? Um, that report is about four years and a half years old. And then the second question, and I have to, hate to put Ms. Gaffney on the spot, but is there anything that's historical about the central fire station that would prohibit us from raising it and starting over? As someone that went through a renovation of a 1880 build house about halfway through, yeah, we should just knock this thing down and rebuild from scratch. Um, so is there anything that would prevent us from doing that in terms of um, rules, laws, and historic dis designations, and, and the like? So those two items. And then if you want to go over again the the space piece, that would be terrific. And then, Denise, if you don't mind. So I, I got the second question, which is, can uh, are we allowed to think about tearing down the central fire? Is it historical? And have we thought about that? And what's, you know, is it possible? And your first question was? Why we abandoned the 2017 study that had all the information relative to going from two fire stations, three fire stations to response time. Why do we ab abandon uh, the response time analysis from the 2017? So let me start with the, the 2017 feasibility study. Uh, we, we looked at that study very well. It's actually a very uh, foundation for all we did here. Uh, we, there were some things that we abandoned from that study that we thought would not be implementable six years later. In terms of, and the first one is the reduction of fire stations, the number of fire stations. That's something that we, from the get-go, as I presented earlier, that was a main principle for the committee, that uh, a principle that we based our pre-design options. Uh, because we were maintaining three fire stations at the same location, we're you know renovating the buildings or tearing down the old buildings and creating new buildings. Because we're keeping the three fire stations at the exact same three locations, there has that provides no impact to response times. The response time for the central fire engines two and three today will be the response time in 2026 20, or in seven years when this is done. So for us, response times are a mute point uh, for the fire department in this, in this effort. The second question about have we looked at, what are the impact of tearing down? Can we tear down central fire? That building is a historic building, and uh, there is historic, historical assignment by all three levels of government, municipal, state, and federal. Uh, it, is, uh, historical, uh, it is a historic building for Melrose. It is within the historic district, so that answers one question. It is also historic at the state and federal level. In fact, if you uh, go to the website of uh, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Historic Commission, uh, they have a brochure explaining uh, the different levels of uh, assignment. And Melrose is actually the, the, in the cover of their manual showing that that is a building that is both local government, state government, federal government assigned as a historic building. So as an architect, I look at that, and that's a red flag to even think about uh, tearing down that building. In, and even, I think, our proposal of putting an addition in the back, which is not visible for Main Street, uh, is already quite aggressive. And as an architect, as a team, our architects will have to actually have a really good argument to convince the Mass Historical uh, Commission that we must put an addition in the back. So even putting an addition, touching the building, I think it's already very aggressive. So no, that building cannot be torn down. reinforce something else that was said earlier with regard to your question about why three versus two if you look back at that slide 16 uh, Emmanuel noted that there wasn't actually a significant amount of square footage added 
Throughout this process, we've really tried to allow the needs that have been identified to guide our deliberations, and there is a significant square footage need, and because of the restrictions and the constraints at Central Fire, the only way to get those additional, that additional space is to add to the other two stations. So that is why there's not an option to abandon one of the three and just move forward with two. The other thing is even the modest improvements that are made to Central Fire, those are really intended to bring the building up to code and to make sure that it is code compliant, it is ADA accessible, it has adequate space that it does not have today, but it is not really an expansion of space in that particular building. Any additional space is really intended to allow for code compliance and some additional usable space. So that's the other really key reason why we're not moving why we don't endorse the recommendation to go with two fire stations over three, in addition to the uh, desire to not impact response times and some of the other uh, things that have been raised. Jeff, I don't know where you went. There were two questions over here. Uh, Good morning, my name is John Sands. I'm a homeowner, also a uh, fire department uh, employee. I like what I'm hearing. I, 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 I'm happy with what I'm seeing, um, and I might be pessimistic, and maybe this is meeting number three, I should ask this question, but um, what Saugus years ago went for a fire station, apparatus, and personnel. The city gave them fire station, pers no personnel, and the, uh, the apparatus. What happens if this is going dead exclusion and it fails? Is there a plan B, or is this? No. Excellent. Thank you. I, I appreciate your honesty. Hi there. Um, my name is Corey Mendonca. Uh, my husband was asking a question a few minutes ago there. Um, long time resident. You can call me a lifelong townie for the most part. Um, first, thanks to all of you for putting this all together. You know, the, the condition of the public safety buildings is, is really um, scary. And I'm sorry for all the men and women who have to work in those conditions. And I recognize that um, this is important for the city to do and it's going to cost us a lot of money um, when you ignore maintenance for a long time. It's, it's what happens. It catches up with you. Um, my question, looking at the uh, the fire stations and talking about the construction sequence. There was a mention of temporary space, maybe relocating some of the personnel. Relocating personnel is easy. You've got a couple of big fire engines that need to relocate. Um, there was a lot of detail around that. Maybe you're not at that point yet, but you know, are there thoughts on what that temporary space is for the apparatus, not just the personnel? And then, are those costs baked into your estimates? That is an excellent question. Um, so the first question is: um, Have we thought about? Have we considered the cost of temporary quarters into the cost estimate? The answer is yes. Uh, we, uh, I can tell you that 1.5 million dollars would go through uh, paying for temporary quarters, whatever it is. Uh, we have not, because we're in pre-design, it's way too soon to figure out, to define that. That is one item that needs to be dissected and developed during the design phase. So we're talking about that's something that during, in 2024, 12 months of design, that needs to be figured out. But we already, we don't know what it is, where it is, but we know how much it would cost, $1.5 million. Um, it is, uh, so what we know today is that when we, uh, fire personnel moves out of the current engine three, and that build, sorry, engine two, that building is torn down, uh, engine two personnel can move to central fire and engine three, but that's not enough space to house the personnel from. So we need some additional space. So the, the, the temporary quarters are both for staff and equipment. So it can't be just a, a canopy over a fire, a fire truck. 
right? right? It needs to be personnel as well. So, but we, we haven't figured out, but at least we know the cost. Thank you all. I'm Lila Migliorelli, City Council at Large. Appreciate having this um, session. Thank you all for what you've done and resident engagement. It's really helpful. Um, I found out more information here than what I heard last time at our City Council meeting, so appreciate the additional work and appreciate the comments about um, the, the premium price that we pay for living within I-95. I think that that will come up a lot in terms of cost comparisons. Um, it's, we're looking at a discrete area, also in a discrete period of time. Um, I guess what I just wanted to just reconfirm the timeline, um, sort of in the next few months. So, did I hear correctly? May thirtieth, it would be would get more information on costs, um, what that breakdown would look like for um, residents, and then in terms of it coming before the city council, the schedule is still by mid mid June, and then the November ballot, and um, then just. Going on from there, um, plans for ongoing maintenance for these buildings during the time worth renovation. I know that we've approved, um, accepted some grants to do some uh, work and, and minor repairs that are needed along the way. And so, just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that and those costs over the next several years. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so, I'm just going to. I'm going to touch on the uh, plans for our ongoing timeline and then I will turn it over to somebody else to answer the question about plans for ongoing maintenance of existing buildings. Um, so our charge was to, as a committee, is to finalize our recommendation by um, June. Our plan is to do so by mid-June and to be able to present before City Council before the last City Council meeting in June, which I believe is the 20th. Um, roughly about that time. And then from that point on, it will be up to the mayor and the city council to consider our recommendation and to work towards um, a question language because it will have to ultimately go to the ballot. Um, it's our hope that this will be something that goes to the fall ballot. Um, because we really, the timeline that Emmanuel outlined is really contingent upon us moving as quickly as we can as a community to make sure that, you know, we can get going. Um, those buildings aren't, aren't operational in 2027 if we wait another two years to bring this to the ballot. And also our information is no longer irrelevant. You're know, gonna have to start this process again. So um, I would, so May 30th, excuse me, May 16th is the open houses for police and fire. May 30th is our next public learning session. At that session, we will do sort of like a debt exclusion 101 um, and uh, speak to the tax impacts as we are able to, as best we are able to, and then also revisit the more refined schedule, floor plans, design diagrams, and the pre-design information that we have, which will include more detailed preliminary costs. We are looking to the public to provide input on aspects, just like you're doing today, on aspects of what we've done. There are some things that are kind of, you know, there's not as much, like the question of do we need this or not is not really the type of information we're looking for for the public. We're really looking for things like um, comments about the proposed location for where a new police facility might be, for example, that type of information. Um, and then we will package that up turn it over to you all, and then uh, move forward from there. If there's anything I forgot, feel free to weigh in. Um, no, on the, the only thing I would say, the, the only thing we have to keep in mind is if we want to be on the November ballot, we essentially have, I'll have to check this to verify it again, we have to be third, we have, we have to notify the Secretary of State's office for the purpose of preparing the ballot 30 days beforehand. So that's kind of a hard deadline in terms of making it to November. I will say, I mean, it can, it can, I don't want to say it can go on the ballot at any time, but it theoretically could go on the ballot at any time. But I would reiterate what Ms. Gibbons said about, you know, time, time really is of the essence that the need is clear and um, I'm not sure we'll ever get to a design that everyone thinks, oh my gosh, this is exactly what 29,000 people are going to embrace, and that's what, you know, that's what makes this challenging. 
but I do think I do think time is of the essence. I don't know if you all want to talk about the the ongoing maintenance. I mean, obviously these places are still workplaces that have to function both in terms of protecting the public safety and providing an environment for the men and women who work there uh, to do so. So the uh, you know the most immediate investments are going to be at Central Fire, funded through. Uh, an earmark from the state, so revenue neutral or cost neutral to us. You know, obviously, it, it's $150,000. That doesn't get you too far, quite frankly. But there are some, you know, some basic, quite frankly, almost uh, paint and paper and patching that needs to be done at fire headquarters um, to make it more pleasant during a transition. question about maintenance in the meantime is a really good question and it just reminded me that that's something that we should address in our report to the mayor coming uh, mid-June. Um, here's the reality. If we were to implement this three-phased, uh, three-phases approach is that the police department and the personnel in Engine 2 would be waiting three years from today to have a new, new, two new buildings. Personnel from Central Fire will have to wait five and a half years from today to have a fully functional, get renovated Central Fire. Personnel from Engine 3 would have to have, wait seven years from today to have a, a brand new building. Um, what we call deferred maintenance, right, the, the maintenance that for things that uh, already uh, broke, uh, deferred maintenance is not included in the costs for this effort. We're only looking at new construction or repair uh, renovations and, and additions. So no, we have, this number does not include the cost to maintain those, uh, those facilities. It's not included in our cost today. But those costs, we assume that they had to be you know, paid for anyway, regardless. If we do nothing, if we don't renovate or create new, the city still have to pay for those, that deferred maintenance. But that gives you a good time frame of three years, seven, five and a half years, and seven years uh, of maintenance needs on those stations until there is a new building. One more question in the back here. Thank you again, uh, Monica Madero Solano. Um, again, I uh, was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the in environmental impact of this proposal, um, both in terms of the buildings and whatever upgrades they might have that might make them more green, but also in terms of the Ripley uh, location. I know when we saw the, uh, the picture up there, there's a lot of tree canopy. Um, it, would this mean that a lot of trees would come down in that area? Um, and if so, is there a plan in the proposal to sort of, uh, you know, maybe acquire some more open space or uh, somehow to to mitigate the impact of any, you know, trees, especially older ones that come down. So there were two questions there. Uh, the first one about the proposal, uh, the preferred uh, Ripley site. Uh, yes. There are a lot of trees on that site, and many trees would have to come down to make space for the new building. Uh, if you look at the residential complex next door, uh, where you know trees were came down and you know ledge was uh, chipped to make space for new buildings, uh, you can think of a similar approach to be able to tear down the building that exists there and make space for a new police station, which will be. Uh, bigger, much bigger than the building you see there today. So some trees, would, many trees, would have to come down. And the first part of your question was: um, Are there uh, aspects that would make uh, the new buildings that would make them more green? And yes. Have some, you know, so in the this preliminary cost estimate, we are designing buildings for the next 50 years. So we are uh, uh, adopting uh, sustainability, sustainable design principles. Uh, and trying to create buildings that will be not uh, um, tied to fossil fuels and you know maybe perhaps uh, photovoltaic panels on the on the roof of the buildings so yes these would be uh, lead, lead certified uh, projects there will be green buildings 
Um, with regard to the tree, the loss of tree canopy, typically in any sort of project there would be some steps taken or measures taken to mitigate the impact of the loss of the trees. So that would be part of, I would assume, a manual also part of the design, the full design process and the, um, the permit, permitting and siting process would require some sort of uh, remediation for the loss of tree canopy. And I would echo that um, our codes and standards in the Commonwealth are increasingly becoming greener, so any new construction would have to comply with those, and ideally we would go above and beyond um, to the extent possible. And that might open up the potential to take advantage of all sorts of uh, federal incentives, state incentives, other things to have green buildings. Do not want to suggest that that's going to offset the cost of four new buildings. I'm just noting that um, we are cognizant of the need to make sure that building for the next generation includes um, building in a sustainable way. These are really great and helpful questions. I am capturing them here and we'll be sure to include, um, include them in uh, our report where it makes sense and also repost to our website where we'll be sharing the uh, presentation that was given today. We're, we're just a little over time, but Elena, I think you have another have question. One, one more online question. After the police station moves away from the current site, will the city reuse that property for something else? Or does the city plan to sell off the land? And if so, is the profit from that sale included in the overall cost estimate? Uh, honestly, we haven't decided yet. Uh, we, there's a lot that goes into that. There is certainly, as Ms. Busby mentioned, there are some space needs um, that fly outside of uh, public safety. Um, we also need an assessment of whether or not there's any, any value to that building in any way, shape, or form before we make a decision about that. Certainly we would want to, uh, if the opportunity presents itself, recapture some of that, some of that revenue. Uh, but we don't, have that, we don't have that as part of the plan either way at this time. Well, with that, I think, um, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you for your excellent questions. We are all available. Again, please use the email address that's on our website. Visit our website. Um, attend an open house. Please join us at the next um, learning session. And, you know, thank you. This is really, we really appreciate your taking the time today to hear from us. And um, we avail ourselves to you and to the rest of the public to answer any questions about this important project.